The horrific wildfire that left the historic town of Lahaina in ruins should serve as a wake-up call to the state. The combination of overgrown invasive grasses, flash drought, and hurricane force wind gusts fueled what is now known as the deadliest wildfire in modern U.S. history. The threat of future fires is ongoing, so we're asking, are we doing enough to prevent wildfires? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. It has been six months since a raging wildfire tore through Lahaina, killing 101 people and leveling the town. While few could have predicted the extent of the tragedy, the warning signs were there. But was anyone listening? A federal analysis of wildfire risk to homes says Hawaii on average has a 92 percent greater risk than other states. But according to our own state lawmakers, we spend much less than other states on wildfire fire prevention and response, with an average of $3.2 million each year over the last decade. In the wake of Lahaina, there's an urgency to prevent another wildfire disaster from happening again. We'll ask our panel tonight if enough is being done. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email or call in your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Democratic Representative Linda Ichiyama is the co-chair of the State House Wildfire Prevention Working Group. Lawmakers were asked to identify the causes of wildfires and preventative actions to reduce wildfire risk throughout the state in order to recommend legislative action. Elizabeth Pickett is the co-executive director of the Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization. Through the nonprofit, she works with partners across the state and Pacific region to implement wildfire mitigation, planning, and education projects. And Samantha DeCourt is the chair of the Nanakuli Ma'ili Neighborhood Board and also a member of the Neighborhood Security Watch. She is originally from Hawaii Island. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I want to start with just the basics. Elizabeth, you know, I think before what happened in Lahaina, so many of us were sort of uh, unaware of the danger all around us. How serious is the wildfire threat, not just to the lands that we tend to think of, the, the, you know, the leeward coast, if you will, but how serious is this across the state? We've been tracking wildfire occurrence for about 20 years, and we know that we have several factors that come together to create our wildfire risk. We have ignitions, and those are human caused. So we have a lot of accidental ignitions, and we have a, a climate where we have green up events that then dry out, and so we have lots of standing dead fuel on the ground. And we have um, limited access for firefighters. We have limited infrastructure. So each piece by itself really matters. But when you add them up, you start to see that we have, we have um, high wildfire risk in all areas, a wet side, dry side, Malcolm Mackay, on all islands in the state. So we have, work to, we have some work that we need to do to mitigate all of that. Yeah, that list is pretty long. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative, when you come together as a working group, how do you prioritize which of the things that Elizabeth just laid out should be addressed first? Because we certainly can't get it to it all in one session. Well, thank you very much for having me tonight. And yes, it's always difficult to prioritize the many competing needs. And I think after the Maui wildfires, we recognized that we needed to really take a good hard look at how we can make sure it doesn't happen again. So after, um, after what happened on Maui, House Speaker Scott Psyche formed six working groups, um, bipartisan, that focused on schools, jobs, and our particular working group was wildfire prevention. And um, as Elizabeth just said, we realized that we have a lot of work to do and we came up with over 40 recommendations and some of which have been turned into legislation that is now making its way through session. When you look at the, the 40 recommendations, what stands out to you as the ones that are the easiest to tackle that you think that we'll be able to actually do and have a meaningful you know, difference in that risk? Gosh, that's a difficult question. I think it's because we have so much to do uh, and so our, 
Our working groups prioritize for each group uh, several pieces of legislation that are part of our bipartisan wildfire uh, package. So there are 10 bills and two resolutions that are right now working their way through the House. They've all been heard in their first committees and hopefully will be heard in the Senate. Okay. Samantha, you live on the west side of Oahu, one of the driest areas. Uh, what are the concerns that you hear from folks who are coming to the neighborhood board, particularly, I would think, where you live for the access points and being able to evacuate if necessary? Yeah, so, you know, Waianae, we are, uh, wildfires are nothing new uh, to Waianae. We deal with that pretty often, uh, more often than I would hope that any community would have to deal with wildfires. Uh, as a matter of fact, Waianae, uh, we have the most fire ignitions um, in the state. And so what we really want to highlight is that what happened in Lahaina should never happen again. Um, there were a lot of warning signs that happened in Lahaina. There were a lot of uh, ways we could have mitigated that. A lot of people, such as um, Elizabeth and her organization, has really tried to use platforms to bring awareness. Um, and so with that, I really want to put on the forefront how vulnerable Waianae is. I mean, there's a lot of great uh, aspects of Waianae, but most importantly, we have a lot of native forests there. And, and a lot of those plants, uh, they don't exist anywhere else in the world. So those plants are indigenous. And if they go, that's it for Waianae. Um, not only that, but we have the largest native Hawaiian homestead population in the world. And so not only do we have endangered native uh, trees, but we also have endangered native people. And so we just really need to prioritize um, why and I and just make sure that we are getting the resources that we need because according to the community, and I've seen it myself, we don't have the resources. We're not ready, we're not prepared. Uh, the community is definitely uh, a working community and we're willing to be there for each other. So I'm gonna be honest, I probably have more faith in my community than I do in the agencies that are being formed to help us. Mm. We already have some viewers writing in and thank you so much. We love the participation. This comes from Joyce and Lahaina and Elizabeth. I I wonder if you could tackle this one. Uh, what is the plan on dealing with the elephant grass and other weeds that have sprouted from recent rains? By August 2024, the landscape will return to dry brush and a danger once again to Lahaina. Who will do what by when? I, I don't think that you can necessarily answer her question directly in terms of, you know, cutting back those grasses, but talk a little bit about the landscape changes that we've seen as a state. You know, we sugarcane left uh, in the mid 90s, and since then a lot of that fallow land has gave way to these invasive grasses, uh, especially what Joyce is talking about. What are your concerns with that, and, and how do we deal with this? Because we're talking about tens of thousands, I believe it's 25% of the state. Yeah, so we do have a million acres of the grasses that people have uh, recently become really concerned about. Um, and that's a lot for a four million acre state to have that much of our land cover um, so fire prone. It's a little bit less about the species of grass, whether it's invasive or native, or if it's naturalized and it's here to stay, it's really about the management of that grass. So we know that we started seeing more and more fire when active agriculture went out of production and land was allowed to just sit there unmanaged. So I think where we need to head is to in the future is thinking about how we better manage our lands, how we focus on returning to active agriculture, <clears throat> excuse me, or other community uses of that land, or incentivize or have penalties for um, to to make sure that we are able to deal with the grass that's growing. So grass does not spontaneously combust. People do not need to go dig out their lawns. It's not really about the grass. It's really about how we manage our land and water and how we manage those lands. It's tricky because in Hawaii, it's a patchwork of, of um, land ownerships. So what we really need is cooperation and collaboration to figure out how to manage those lands across all of those different ownerships. And so the, the truth is where we need to go is engagement and participation in better land management. And, and to that point, Eric and Kailua has this question, and Representative Ichiyama, I would love for you to take this one. Has the legislature talked about funding maintenance crews either at the state or county level to keep fallow fields trimmed or lower the threat of wildfires? Yes, and I would just Note that the state Department of Land and Natural Resources is responsible for 1.3 million acres, so a little over a quarter of our total state lands. And the department has come in with a request for an additional $7 million in operating expenses to better manage those lands, just like Elizabeth mentioned. They're also asking for $13 million in equipment 
bulldozers, um, heavy machinery to cut fire breaks and better manage our own state lands. Uh, so we're, that request is making its way through the budget process now and uh, we're hoping that it can pass in the end of session. Okay, uh, there's a question from Rod in Kona and Samantha I would love to get your thoughts on his sentiment here. It says it appears that tragedies are the only thing that galvanize government officials for action. Why is that? What is your thought to Rod tonight? Yeah, well, I mean, unfortunately, that's what we're dealing with is uh, damage control. Like how I said earlier, uh, we've been crying out for uh, the, these kinds of resources for decades. Um, so just like Lahaina, that was nothing new. In 2018, there was something very similar. Uh, but the only difference with Lahaina, it wasn't able to jump over the highway. So um, again, uh, instead of us being reactive, we really have to be proactive. Now, uh, Department of Transportation has been doing a great job on the Waianae Coast. They cleared a lot of the fire breaks, so I'm very thankful for that. But as uh, Elizabeth had shared, we do have large private ownership uh, on the Waianae Coast, so it does become a little complex when we're dealing with organizations like DHHL, you know. Uh, their department has been formed to build homes for Native Hawaiians, so when they are one of the largest one of the largest uh, landowners on the Waianae Coast, we've really got to come behind them and support them because their organization isn't equipped for uh, resource protection. Um, so yes, uh, I hope that again, we learn from Lahaina and make sure that this never happens again. As we know, Waianae is very vulnerable and very susceptible. We are really only one way in and one way out. So we really have to put all hands on deck to make sure that uh, Waianae is, is safeguarded. You Can know, I add to that actually? Please, yes. So one of the bills moving through the legislature that's a new idea that kind of fits into what uh, Samantha was saying is a fire shed partnership. Uh, people may be familiar with our watershed partnerships that work across public, private boundary lines because we know that it's important to protect our native forests all over regardless of who the owner is. And so we're looking at a model like that for fire sheds because we know that fire doesn't care whose property line it is, and we need to work collaboratively uh, to make sure that those lands are managed. So that's one thing that we are looking at. So tell me a little bit more about how that would work. So really it's a collaboration of public and private landowners. Uh, so it could be DHHL, Department of Land and Natural Resources, large landowners like Kamehameha Schools, coming together and saying, how can we work together to leverage our, our funds and our resources to, uh, for example, deal with native grasses, plant invasive grasses, plant more native plants, or do other cross-boundary work to make sure that, you know, it's not just limited to one property owner, but all property owners. Mm. My, uh, Malia in Waimanalo has a question uh, for you, Elizabeth. It says, a lot of money, time, and effort was put into reforestation in the islands to counter the effects of cattle and over-harvesting of sandalwood and other trees. Why can't that same effort be put into replanting indigenous plants? Wouldn't that help? When we look at transforming this land, uh, what kind of a lens should we look at in terms of what, how to manage it? You're saying don't pull out all the grass, but could replanting, um, obviously that could be a part of it. What about putting in the indigenous species that uh, Malia is talking about? Yeah, there, well, there's a time and a place for everything. And I think everything that we do to manage land is better than just letting it sit and letting land banking happen where it's just not managed. So there's a lot of different methods that are used. And you have to think about that patchwork of ownership. and the desired future land use, the desired community benefits. And so, you know, we have um, grazing is a really good tool to use and it produces food and it munches down the grass. And so that's a really appropriate tool. And in other areas, um, replanting and reforesting is a really good solution. And um, that not every place is suited to be able to, it's so much investment. I guess that, that's the issue with um, reforestation projects. They're very expensive, they're very slow growing, and we don't always have the resources to do it at scale. And so we have to think through that patchwork of ownership and the patchwork of capacity and what's appropriate for the site. But there are lots of different methods. We know how to do it. It's been a lack of capacity to get those methods on the ground in place to counteract all of that fire prone fuel. Right, and when you're talking about a million acres, um, you know, there, there's that saying about that eating an elephant, you do it one bite at a time. This yeah. is an awfully big elephant. So, you know, when we look, uh, already we're in the wet season as we noted, but the dry season will be here before we know it. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at what's coming our way, 
how much can be managed in time? And, and how do we prioritize where to put the resources? Do we send them to Samantha's neighborhood? Are there other neighborhoods that also need that? And, and how do we figure out where to go first? There isn't really a first. There's a, everybody doing their part adds up to a lot of action all concurrently, which is what we need. So we often say there's a role for everyone to play in wildfires. So um, we need homeowners to take action around their home and yards to reduce wildfire risk. We need neighborhoods coming together to take action in the communal areas to protect the subdivision or the neighborhood from wildfire risk. There's a lot of projects to be done at those neighborhood and personal levels. We need to be working with large landowners and land stewards and farmers and ranchers to be dealing with the landscape level risk. And so there really is this role for everyone to play. And then in order for all of those folks to have the capacity and the education to do it, we need, we need the science to be coming out, we need to offer best practice education, and we need a regulatory and a funding environment that supports each of those sectors and those community groups to do that work. So it really is not just like where do we start first, but rather we start everywhere with everybody engaged and doing that at the same time. Yeah, and I'll just weigh in on that as well. Um, on the Waianae Coast, you know, we have different ahupua systems. And I think it's important that we allow the community to weigh in because every ahupua is different. And so I think that when we start to bring the community to the table, we can identify where those hot spots are. Where are those locations? Um, who are these landowners that we can partner with and come and help to mitigate these areas? Vegetation management is very important. Um, and so I think that in addition to planting and uh, building fire breaks, I think all of that encompassing will come from our community members that know where these areas that are most vulnerable are at. Uh, Maybe we could actually talk about the wildfire protection plan that Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization works with communities to... To identify, yeah. So the community wildfire protection plans are actually uh, a federally recognized process that yields a document, but it's not a plan in the, the conventional sense where it's identified exactly what will happen and everybody sticks to that plan, but rather it's kind of a clearinghouse of community priorities. So we work with agency folks, people in different sectors, fire, forestry, um, natural resources management, and we go and do lots of community meetings for input. And so what happens is that we are able to identify everybody's concerns, their recommended actions, and then together we can prioritize. And so for each area, we have these really custom priority project lists that then we can all start to work together to, um, to tackle. And what's really cool about that is that just the process alone brings folks together to start figuring out who can bring what to the table. And so these plans are in place and we're updating them statewide over the next two years. So I do want to encourage people to participate because what we work on is a reflection of who shows up and what priorities are mentioned. Because everything goes into the plan, we honor all the voices that come to the table. And then it, what's nice is we have the project list, but we also have the relationships starting to build and we can have localized working groups that carry those things forward. Are there any areas that don't have a plan yet that you would like to see a plan develop? Oh yeah, currently we have, um, you know, it's been very hard to raise the funds to get all of these projects done um, over the years, but we have, we identified areas that have a high fire risk and that have, um, uh, well, and then we, we were able to get all of the first two tiers of fire risk covered in these plans. And so the final parts are mostly in the windward areas that haven't been covered yet in plans. Central Oahu has not been done yet. Um, but I'm very hopeful because we have a lot of applications for grant funding and other things out there to blanket the entire state in the next two years. So currently there's a few places that aren't covered, but we're working on that. Representative Aishiyama, I'm interested to know, you know, when we look at all the, the litany of things that need to be done, it, none of it's free, right? So what, what resources do you think will be needed in this session and in years to come to actually address this? Sure. I think it will be an ongoing commitment that we need to make. And I think that uh, Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization actually has put in a grant and aid application to mm -hmm. do some of that work. And as I mentioned earlier, Department of Land and Natural Resources came in with a roughly $20 million funding request for equipment, for ongoing operations. And so hopefully we'll be able to support those requests going forward. 
There's a caller who has a question here. It says, it's hard to prevent fires when they are being intentionally set. A lot of the fires, especially in Waianae, are seen as a result of arson. Um, tell us a little bit about what's being done to prevent that, uh, you know, because when you have that kind of environment and you have people intentionally setting fires, that's obviously a, a terrible outcome. Yeah, I mean, whether the fire be intentionally lit or it's because of weather or a utility line, um, we still have to handle it and address it in the same way. Um, and so, again, these preventative measures of fire breaks, of uh, replanting, and just making sure that regardless where the fire came from, that we know that we've taken those preventative measures. And so I will say again um, that the Waianae Coast, and as you folks know, um, is one way in and one way out. And so a part of the discussions that I've been having with the community is stressing the urgency of having another access road. There's a few discussions that are on the table right now. Um, the longer goal, I believe, is Kole Kole Pass. Um, maybe not even in my lifetime, uh, but the shorter goal is some other access roads that we can open up. And so I'm thankful that we're starting that discussion. Uh, the Department of Transportation had allocated funds to uh, put towards another access road. So I'm thankful that, that those things are starting to be discussed. Um, so again, there's mm -hmm. many ways that we can um, go at uh, the solutions on the Waianae coast, but we've got to start at these areas that have been just terribly neglected. And we want to welcome in another guest this evening. Michael Walker is here. He serves as the statewide fire protection forester for the Department of Land and Natural Resources Division of Forestry and Wildlife. He was born and educated in Florida and has more than two decades of conservation experience in Hawaii. And we know you were on assignment on Kauai today, and that's why you joined us just a little bit late. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, we have a lot of viewer questions coming in already, uh, and Elizabeth has been um, kind of giving us a broad overview of some of the dangers, but I'd love to get your perspective here. Um, it says here, the current large landowner map posted on the state of Hawaii government's website indicates the largest landowner in West Maui is the state of Hawaii. Is the state of Hawaii going to hold itself accountable for managing fuel loads on its property? Um, what is the state doing to manage all these grasses and, and, you know, all this land, if you will? Well, we actually do manage grasses on our land. Uh, it just depends really on what parcel you're looking at and the priorities of the division. So we receive money from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Natural Resource Conservation um, folks to put in a network of fire breaks uh, along basically the forested watershed side of the West Maui Mountains. And so uh, we can only do so much with what we have. You know, even though we manage 26% of the lands in the state, the Department of Land and Natural Resources as a whole receives less than 1% of the state's budget. And the Division of Forestry and Wildlife receives a, l a little sliver of that as well. So uh, we would love to put in and maintain more fire breaks. This really is just how much money do we have and how many people do we have to maintain those fire breaks. And Representative, do you see more allocations going toward, toward his department to make that kind of a change then? Yes, it actually included in the governor's budget this year, as well as the House uh, Bipartisan Wildfire Package. There is a large sum of money that we're trying to appropriate to Department of Land and Natural Resources for operating expenses, equipment, additional personnel, so they can expand their fire break network, and also some of the uh, pilot projects that they've been working on, shaded fuel breaks, grazing projects, and then working directly with landowners who are adjacent to our watersheds to make sure that they're also uh, using best practices. We have so many questions, so I want to get to as many as possible. And, and sort of building on what Samantha was talking about, access roads. Elizabeth, there's a question here from Daryl in Pearl City. Prevention starts with planning. Why in this day and age would government allow development of communities with only one way in and out? Seems illogical. Um, can you tell us about the importance of planners and planning when it comes to pr fire prevention and also, you know, if indeed a wildfire does come to your community, that you are able to get out? Yeah, this question really matters to me, so I appreciate that it's come up. Um, when, we, when we look at, so, at what creates so much of the risk that we have, every, a lot of people are talking about grass, 
and a lot of people are talking about ignitions, and I think it really needs to pivot in some ways to include talking about good planning. We need to be safer from the start. Communities and firefighters, they inherit the risk um, that is kind of integrated into how our areas are designed, how our towns and our buildings are developed. And I've really tried to think through how did we get here to where so many of our communities have only one way in and out. We have highly combustible building materials. We don't have adequate setbacks. We don't have adequate infrastructure. We don't have perimeter fuel breaks or defensible space. How did we get to that scenario? And I really, I feel um, some level of forgiveness for it in some ways because Hawaii is not a fire. Um, it's not a state that grew up with wildfire. We are not fire adapted or fire dependent in our native ecosystems. It, like, like other places in the con continental U.S. are, where fire has always been a part of the ecology. Our fire issues have increased exponentially in just one or two generations. And everything we are doing now is trying to catch up with that new, fairly novel situation that we're facing. So our areas were not designed with wildfire front and center or even just some of the other newer hazards or climate change sort of situations that are coming up. We, were, we didn't have all of that front of mind when we were developing. We did, that's why our policies, our budgets, our subdivisions, all of those things are now playing catch up. And yeah, and, and, but it's an important question because moving forward, there's no excuse for leaving it out now. And so I think the question is, what do we do now to make sure that our developments have two ways in and out, have adequate setbacks, have defensible space, and area perimeters and fuel breaks? We have lots of examples where, with just a tweak in the design, we could have, for instance, the golf course around the community instead of the homes protecting the golf course if a fire comes through. We can actually do some tweaks to our designs and have a lot safer communities to live in and a lot safer areas for firefighters to enter and try to help if there is an event. So it's a really important question, especially as we build back in areas that have been damaged and impacted, we need to build back safer. Well, and what you're saying is really also important, this idea that we didn't grow up with wildfires, or at least not the consciousness in the way that we see them now. And mm -hmm. Samantha, um, there are two, two one, one is a comment and one is a question here. Programs like this on PBS Hawaii are great, but we need outreach efforts at the grassroots level, so to speak, to educate all of us about the hazards that we face. That's from Walter and Makiki. And JC from in Kapolei says, for Samantha, are the communities on the Waianae Coast well informed? If not, what would you like to see happen to change that? you know, g building on what Elizabeth had just said. Uh, this is one thing that I can say about our community is that we are very strong, we're very resilient. Uh, you know, when Lahaina happened, uh, it took uh, the federal government um, about four or five days to get there. Uh, by then, the communities from the Waianae Coast was boating supplies over to Lahaina. So if there is anything that I'm confident in is that our community will always protect our community. Um, so I'm thankful for that. Uh, I apologize, what was the other question? Well, just this idea that is there more that can be done on education oh, piece? Oh, there's always more that can be done. Um, <coughs> and I think that the more that we have these discussions are good. Uh, I think there is a more urgent tone uh, when people are having talks about wildfires, especially on the Y and I coast. Uh, and to Elizabeth's um, uh, point about the golf courses, you know, in 2018, when we had three valleys up in flames all at the same time, it was the golf course that was not uh, phased at all. And that becomes that they are well irrigated, they are well watered. Uh, we didn't have to grow up with this kind of culture because we had a good vegetation system. And uh, since the water has been, we've been in drought, uh, some areas water has been diverted, uh, again, we have to secure our um, power grids, you know, just things like that. So, so yeah, so I'll say that. I think that was about 10 responses in two <laughs> questions. So. Do you mind if I <laughs> Not to at all. add Please on top ahead. of that? Because the education piece, our fire departments, State Forestry and Wildlife, and Hawaii Wildfire Management, we've been working for years to develop exactly those kinds of educational materials and opportunities. So all of our agencies and um, fire departments, emergency management uh, agencies, and um, forestry and wildlife, we have um, put together several resources. So there's a Ready, Set, Go 
comprehensive resource that people can use. It talks about fire in general, what to know about fire in Hawaii, and all the things you can do around your home, your yard, and with your family to prepare for fire so that your own property re re um, resists being ignited if embers are f flying into your yard and also what to do in case of evacuation. So we have a lot of personal and family home level preparedness information that is endorsed and vetted by all of our fire experts. And we also have a dry season campaign, wildfire and drought lookout. And I just want to note that the information has been out there and for a long time we couldn't get people to be interested. And I'm really, really encouraged by this interest now and this willingness to learn and, and get better prepared. And so for those people who are interested and don't know about these resources, I just want to encourage you to go on the Forestry and Wildlife DOFA um, website or to the Hawaii Wildfire website, or actually all the fire departments are, now have it posted. We're trying to make it as easy to find as possible. And for those who want to go beyond the household level and learn more about what you can do at the neighborhood or subdivision level, there's a neighborhood action support program called FireWise, and we invite communities to participate and learn what they can do um, to take action and, and to mitigate risk around their communities. So there are a lot of opportunities, and we're really hoping that people make use of those. I want to bring in, there's there's a, a bunch of questions. Uh, Representative Ichiyama, I hope that you can sort of give us a little bit of a big picture on this. Uh, a lot of questions about the utility system and perhaps burying some underground. Uh, I want to just read a couple of these. Uh, Alan from Haleiwa, Hawaii needs to harden the electrical grid as well as its emergency communication systems and regular cell phone communications as both backhaul, with both backhaul redundancy. Will Haima act on previously suggested plans? Linda in Mililani says, as soon as I heard about this, I thought of other towns like Haleiwa and Kailua coastal towns, which also have antiquated electrical wires dangling from wooden poles. All this wiring should be buried underground to avoid future mayhem. Michael from Kau says, uh, when would Hawaii, especially Lahaina, start putting new power lines underground? And David on Maui says, how many wildfires over the last decades have been started by electric utility failures, wind, broken conductors? Is the electric company going to harden their grid and install better power line fault detectors? Now, I know you don't speak for HECO, um, but I do, I am interested to know what those conversations is li are like uh, in the wake of what's happened. Well, certainly, I think that uh, HECO is looking at all of their options now uh, after the wildfires. I think undergrounding is has been very expensive and in some circumstances cost prohibitive, but they have said after what happened on Maui, all the options are on the table. I think what we also have to keep in mind is that uh, in some ways when HECO bears additional costs, those costs can be passed on to ratepayers. Right, so we also have to keep that in mind. There is legislation this session to require all electric utilities to come up with a wildfire mitigation plan that must be uh, approved by the Public Utilities Commission. And that plan would include things such as grid hardening, underground, undergrounding lines, or putting on um, certain type of equipment that would uh, make the line not have electricity if they notice that it's you know damaged. So we are looking at ways to require all of our utilities to be safer and also trying to figure out the right balance so that we're not overburdening our ratepayers. Okay, um, a totally different question here for you, Michael. Uh, in <coughs> Seattle North nor and the Northwest, they use goats to clear brush and dry lands. Did Hawaii ever think outside of the box like this? Miley from Keaau, same thing. Why not use goats to eat overgrown grasses and brush? They can get to a lot of places people cannot easily get to and could be a food source. Now, Elizabeth did talk about grazing as a possibility for some kind of prevention, but what about this idea of, of grazing as a way to do this? Uh, we've promoted that for years, and there's uh, a private company on Hawaii Island that has a herd that's mobile, that, that they're moving around animals. There's some folks based out of Waimanalo that are doing that as well. Uh, another uh, Leeward Coast community member that we work with, um, he's started his own sheep farm to create a fire break uh, in Waianae as well as Ka'ala Farms has also got sheep and they are expanding their operation to use sheep to reduce the fuels on the landscape. So it's, it's not an idea that's new to us and we promoted it a lot and there's even a 
couple of seminars, Grazing to Reduce Blazing, mm -hmm. that PFX and Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization has put out. So it's, um, it's, it's something we've talked about for a while. This is, you know, <laughs> I think the awareness of the situation has become, you know, more people are paying attention now. Can I add on to that? Yes. Um, we also have a lot of ranches that already have cattle for food production, and I, they have been really amazing partners in strategically grazing around community areas and have long been part of what is going right in terms of mitigation. So where we might have lacked capacity before, we've had strong partnerships in place with people who are already um, in you know producing food and already having animals on the landscape and so grazing you know there's there's a um, there's been a tension over the years because feral animals have caused damage to our native landscapes but strategically managed well managed grazing at this point is our best tool for such a large and challenging landscape with all this fuel so it's um it's it's something we want to promote more of, and it can happen in backyards, and it can happen at large production scales. So I'm glad that that question came up. Yeah, yeah. Could I add one more thing? So the, the decline of the agricultural sector in Hawaii since the 1960s also includes ranching. And so a lot of ranches have gone out of business just because they just haven't been able to make a profit. And so one of the th ideas that we're promoting is that service grazing should really be part of the ranching industry where they can make money providing a service for people and reducing fuels on the landscape that could supplement their income and keep ranching alive in Hawaii. There's a question from Mililani, um, and Samantha, I'd love for you to tackle this one. My neighbor has, over, uh, has an overgrown backyard of dry grass and trees, which is a hazard to the neighbors. We tried going to the neighborhood board. They say they can't walk onto their property. What can we do to protect us without having our neighbor lash out at us? So, you know, we're talking on the broad scale level, but on an individual level, what are you advising folks to do in their own communities? So the city did pass a bill um, that actually, if your neighboring property if your neighbor uh, does pre uh, does have a risk uh, with regards to fire, um, those kinds of things, uh, to call the Honolulu Fire Department um, and they'll be able to help. Uh, and uh, hey, I, I, I'm always a doer, so you know if I see a problem, I'll probably get my weed whacker out and just start <laughs> weed whacking. Um, so I think that we all have to have all, all hands on deck and not everybody knows how to properly care for their yard. It's not uh, so common sense that everybody should know, but I think that if we as a community come together and show each other that, you know, we're really here to malame each other, I think that people will be more inclined to take care. Can and I add to that? It's really important that the way fire works is that fire can only travel where there's fuel and if you are taking care of your home and your yard, you are ignition resistant and it doesn't matter if it's burning over there. So you actually have a lot of empowering options to take care of your own home and yard. And until you've done that, it's really easy to point over on the other side of the fence, but it's also very important to take care of your own business. And the fire science um, that, we, that we trust and understand, they burn homes in these warehouses to figure out what ignites and how best to manage your home and yard. And the biggest bang for the buck you get in terms of protection is from your outside edge of your, of your home to five feet out. And if that is combustible free, you are doing really good at protecting your home from fire and that's on your own property and you can sweep and you can clear out the leaves from your gutters and you can trim and you can remove all the dead and dying debris and branches and leaves. Um, you have so much power and so I think a lot of people feel discouraged when they look over the fence and they see all this stuff that they think is going to put them at risk but you do have a lot of say even more say when you take action around your own home and yard. Mm -hmm. And so I want people to know that. And that's so good to hear because I think we can all manage five feet. Yeah. Right, we're talking about yeah. a million acres and so that feels like yeah. a lot. And the more we do in the built environment, the more we do around our homes and yards, the less all of that is gonna matter. And also, if all one million, two million people start calling the fire department, we only have a few inspectors who can go out and, and, the, and we wanna make sure that we don't put them to where they're managing all the neighbor relations and really that they're able to go where there, there's really high risk and they're really needed. And so maybe maybe don't call until you've actually done your part and you're working your way out and you're working with your community and 
um, you've, you've worked from that side of things. So you can call, I just, they're all, they're super overloaded and yeah. it oftentimes is before people have done their own work. So I just want to encourage people that you actually can get yourself safe. Um, even just like this weekend when you do your yard work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's not discourage people to not call. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, with a community member specifically, she had called me because there was a neighboring property that was clearing a lot of brush that was pushing it all the way to the edge of the fence. So, when we are in the season that we're in where a fire hazard is very sensitive, people get very concerned and they're calling out for help. So I think in, because I was dealing with a real life situation on a community member, uh, the neighborhood board had to get involved. We had to get DPP involved. We had to get the Honolulu Fire Department uh, involved, but that's what it takes to just make sure that people feel protected when they see something uh, and they're calling out for help and we don't bring them the resources and as leaders in the community, how good are we? Right, and Bob and Kaneohe has a question that kind of widens this out, uh, Representative Ichiyama. Can't the state or county use emergency powers to mitigate a hazard on private land? They seem to use them for everything else. The private land arguments seem weak. This idea that we have this patchwork quilt, if you will, of land that needs to be addressed. Uh, you know, when we look at trying to manage the private landowner lands or privately owned lands, what do you say to Bob and Kaneohe? Is there a way to use emergency power powers to access that? Well, I think it would be dependent upon the governor and the mayor to declare an emergency under HRS chapter 127A and to declare that emergency and then um, take action under their statutory ability. But I would say that, you know, going back to Elizabeth's point, it, uh, it can start with everyone. And I think there is heightened awareness around now landowners, especially liability mm -hmm. for having conditions on your property that could cause a wildfire that could cause damage to others' property. And so I'm hopeful that, for example, with our fire shed bill and more attention and focus on this issue, a lot of people will want to come to the table and do the right thing. There's a question from Jody and Kihei. Michael, I'd love for you to take this one on. I heard the fires in upcountry, upcountry Maui actually burned for months via root systems. No buildings have burned since the August disaster, but that scenario is scary. Is this common in other places? Yes, it's common here in the state, uh, particularly with the root systems and the duff layer that we have here, that once a fire does get down into the root system, it can sit there and smolder for months. I've I've worked on fires that they reignited a couple of months later. So as, as long as there's no rainfall coming in to really saturate the ground, this is a potential that we have to deal with. And this is really the first time this has happened in the urban environment. But uh, there was a fire, the Leilani fire, uh, that was initially a fire on PTA. And uh, I think about a month and a half, two months later, reignited and then burned another 13,000 acres. Uh, so. How, how do you manage something like that? Because you can't obviously see underground. Yeah, there, you can deploy um, certain technology, like uh, one of the things we're asking for in our budget ask is for a lot more thermal drones that we can fly. So then we can map out hot spots that we can see from the air that you may not be able to see visually and then we can go and and treat those accordingly okay um samantha can you take this one from li'ilani the waianae coast is one of the areas at high risk for wildfires on the island of oahu i am native i'm a native hawaiian from waianae now living in hilo the big island has several volunteer fire organizations are there any on oahu specifically in waianae i agree wholeheartedly with being proactive but additional help would be great uh, when these wildfires happen so again, uh, as Elizabeth had shared, you know, there have been pillars uh, in our community that have had these discussions for decades. Um, Kaala Farms, we have Malama Learning Center, we have Bullet Yaya, I mean, the list goes on and on. We have the Keolana family. Um, and so uh, we do have our community leaders um, that are, uh, do have plans in place. Um, however, when we're talking about a population of 55,000 residents, uh, when we're talking about 
uh, a threat immediately, people are going to go into survival mode. Uh, so we can plan as much as possible, we can clear as much as possible, but when the threat is here, uh, we don't know how people are going to respond, so we just have to be ready for anything. And, you know, the topic of you know, our segment is, are we doing enough to prevent wildfires? And I think that uh, we've been talking about wildfires for decades, like how I said, fires are nothing new to the Waianae Coast. Um, so I think the time for talking is over. I think we have to start putting some real action uh, to the discussions that are taking place, because uh, we've got to prioritize these areas again to make sure that Lahaina does not happen in any other area in the state of Hawaii. Yeah, uh, Elizabeth, I wonder, you know, is it frustrating when you, the first thing you said when you joined us uh, this evening was we've been looking at this for 20 years, right? So we, we've, we you know, certain parts of our community have known this was a problem for a long time. Mm -hmm. And you also said later in the discussion that you're finally getting the attention that, uh, that it deserves. This issue is finally getting the attention it deserves. You know, is, is all of this frustrating to you at this point? Yes and no. So, um... I actually think a lot of people were doing a lot of good things for many years and maybe it was quiet and underpublicized but there are a lot of partners like I said natural resource managers, ranchers, conservation folks um, and actually a lot of communities who had had scares and had fire come close there were a lot of people already taking action and so I actually was hopeful that whole time seeing it pick up, seeing the programs develop. We have the fire waste program, our fire departments and others, emergency responders have all come together to create these programs and resources. I actually thought we were doing really well. So the discouraging part was when I realized it wasn't enough and that, 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 that the progress was kind of slow, but I was so encouraged that it was even happening. And then I realized we really need to speed it up and it's gonna take everybody we have this like civic responsibility to do our part, to take care of our yard and home, to engage in the ways we need to, to create the funding and regulatory environment. I just realized like, well, it was, it, there was progress, but it was a little too slow and it wasn't at scale. And so um, now I realize I'm, instead of being frustrated, I'm actually hopeful because like I said, there's a role for everyone to play and now everyone's stepping into those roles. So rather than being frustrated, I'm looking around thinking, I never thought we'd make it here. I never um, would have wanted all of this awareness and concern to happen because of the tragedies that we've experienced. But now that we're here and people are learning, they're stepping up, they're asking the right questions, I think we have a, a, a safer future ahead of us because people are finally engaged. Okay, that's very encouraging. Mm -hmm. uh, Maggie in Kohala has a question. Uh, Hawaii Island has a system that utilizes private landowners and heavy equipment operators who can be called into action when a fire breaks out. Is that true on other islands? Is the state doing anything to try to support so that you know these folks who have these resources already can be deployed a little bit more easily? The short answer is yes, but I'll defer to Department of Land and Natural Resources to give a better answer since they're directly working with the landowners. On Hawaii Island and Maui, uh, in particular parts of Maui, uh, the terrain allows for mechanized fire suppression efforts like bulldozers. Uh, however, due to the terrain on Oahu and Kauai, they can be used in some places, but not so much in others, particularly in, in forestry and wildlife lands. While on Hawaii Island, they employ a lot of bulldozers and backfiring operations in order to um, stop fires, you can't necessarily get a bulldozer up in the Waianae Mountains and get very far with it. So um, they, we do have um, machines that we work with to do fuel reduction projects where it has a forestry head on the end of it and it can go and um, reduce fuels like trees in particular and like at a relatively rapid pace but we currently don't have a dozer at the branch. Uh, we are going to get one, hopefully, with, if everything works out this, <laughs> this legislative session. But yeah, it, it really depends on the, the terrain and whether or not you can use it or not. Samantha, I want to ask you about, uh, this, this is a question specific to Kauai, but I'm interested in how it applies to your community. It says the same thing that happened in Lahaina could also happen in Princeville because there are no warning systems set up here. 
you know, we've talked a lot about prevention and about the landscape, but what about the warning systems? What are your concerns there? Yeah, and I think also, you know, in addition to how we can take preventative measures with what happened in Lahaina is communication was very poor. Uh, getting the word out to Lahaina about what the state was doing, what the federal uh, government was doing, it was very difficult. And so I, I, I'm gonna take the hopeful approach like Elizabeth did and said that we're strengthening our communication. Um, but again, when you're in those moments and survival kicks in, uh, I'm sorry, but if you're gonna try to block our Farrington Highway from us getting out, we're gonna run it over. Um, and again, that comes because of survival skills. You know, when that kicks in, that kicks in. I will say that Haima has been very um, cooperative in helping us to make sure that our sirens are running, they're active, uh, we listen in for them. And so I would say that as far as that's concerned, yes, uh, getting resources to our community. I would hope that uh, state or federal, or any other branch of government uh, would be able to communicate a little better. Okay. Um Moses in Lihue has a question. Elizabeth, can you take this one? There's a lot of information out there about having a two-week supply of water, food, medicine, and other necessities to prepare for a hurricane, a tsunami, perhaps an earthquake. What do we do to prepare for a wildfire emergency? It's a really good question. So each hazard sort of has its own preparation. Tsunamis are different than big, you know, than storms and floods and all. Um, so for wildfire, it's more about watch situational awareness. And so the first part of it is, um, is watching as the seasons change, as we go from looking around in our landscape and our grass is green, and then it starts to turn yellow, and then it turns brown, and then it turns pokey and spiky and gray, and it's definitely dead and kindling. And so as you're watching that change and progress, you should be doing your yard work. You should be getting your community, I mean, your family prepared. Practice your evacuation plan, discuss it, update it, talk to your neighbors, get ready for the, the um, occasion that we, where there could be an evacuation. But also that's the time where you're watching and you're saying, I, I better get on top of my yard work, I better talk to my community, I better, we, we better think this through because the seasons are changing and it's drying out and it's time to get prepared in the, in the bigger picture in the seasonal time scale. And then if there is a fire occurring, um, that's where your situational awareness really needs to be high. Where is it? Do I smell smoke? Do I see smoke? I'm watching it. And if you're concerned, you evacuate early. You don't have to be told to evacuate. You can go to the mall. You can go down somewhere else to just get out of town so you're not part of that evacuation traffic. You can always go back home. And the idea is you're not at the last minute trying to do all of the, that work around your house, but rather you're prepared ahead of time so you can just evacuate early. So it's a little bit different instead of having a two-week supply of something. It's more about watching, being ready, taking action, being prepared in that sense. Okay. And, and I think uh, the Waianae Coast, I think we would feel more confident uh, if we had another access road on what that evacuation plan would look like. Back in 2011, there was a tsunami threat, and it took my in-laws, who live in Makaha, five hours just to get to Nanakuli. That's not too far away. Um, and so again, I'm gonna stress the urgency for an access road. Okay, we have just about two minutes left, but before we go, Representative, how can people engage with what the what legislature is doing? What is your call to action on the individual level to make sure that you know all the work that you, you and the other lawmakers have done actually goes through? Well, thank you for that question. I'd like to share our report this contains all of the recommendations from the six working groups that were put together by House Speaker Scott Psyche. And it contains a lot of the information and resources that Elizabeth talked about tonight. But folks can go to our Capitol website, www.capital.hawaii.gov, access this as a resource and get more information. Okay. M Michael, a final thought from you this evening on this issue. What do you want people to know? Uh, I always like to say that fire is a, it's a kako thing. Everybody has their role to play in protecting their homes, their communities, and their watershed. And they just need to look for the right resources. They can look to Forcing Wildlife's webpage. They can look to Hawaii Wildfire's webpage. There's uh, a variety of resources out there that they can look. They just okay. need to look. And Samantha, what would you say to people tonight on this issue? Well, uh, stay encouraged. You know, I think uh, connect with the right resources, the right organizations, stay informed. Uh, the best thing that we can do is organize with our families, uh, but organize and mobilize your community as well. Okay. 
And Elizabeth, now that people are paying attention, what do you hope they take away from our discussion tonight? Well, the first step is to care, and now people care, so that's encouraging. That's why we're in this hopeful space. People care. Um, but the next stage is to learn more, because it's not just caring. We have to learn. There's a lot of, there are a lot of best practices and things that you can do, so we want people to learn as much as possible and integrate it into our everyday life and into our culture and into how we do things is that we are wildfire safe. And then the next step is we, you know, we care, we learn more. And then we work together to take action because it really does require all of us, like Mike said. You know, when we, when we laid out at the top and, and you mentioned a million acres, about 25% of the state, when do you think we will be fully wildfire safe? I mean, how long will it take us to get there? Depends on how fast everyone steps into their role. <laughs> and so for a long time, we didn't have enough of us and it wasn't widespread and it wasn't multi-sector and everybody doing their part. Um, right now, it's pretty rapid. We're, we're catching up. So if everybody keeps that, we're just, I'm, I worry that it'll come and it'll pass and we'll become complacent again. So this level of interest, fire is here to stay. It's predictable. It's known. We are fire prone. And so this is an ongoing, every day, every year, every weekend doing our housework kind of thing. I mean, our um, yard work. Okay. Yeah. And, and Representative Ishiyama, in the 30 seconds we have left, uh, what is your estimation? You know, I know everyone has to do their part, but how long do you think it will take for Hawaii to be fully fire safe? I think just to echo what Elizabeth said, it's an ongoing thing. Every day, every month, every year, because grass will just continue to grow, right? And so it's not like we will ever be completely done. It's just going to take all of our effort going forward. Okay, well thank you to all of our guests here tonight. And of course we thank our audience for joining us tonight. Mahalo to State Representative Linda Ichiyama and Elizabeth Pickett of the Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization and Fire Protection Forester Michael Walker along with from the Nanakuli Maili Neighborhood Board, Samantha DeCourt. Next week here on Insights, our focus does turn to the Valley Isle and the recovery efforts in Lahaina. Six months after the tragedy, we'll talk about housing, jobs, and rebuilding that community and how they're all moving moving forward. Please do join us then. I'm Yanji Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha.